Let's look at the verb aimi, which is covered by Hansen and Quinn in Greek and Intensive Course in section 115, which is on pages 439 to 440. Aimi is finally the verb to be. You know already from all the work you've done for 14 units that Greek can get away quite happily without using the present of the verb to be. You've done lots of nominal sentences where you've used is or are without actually having to spell it out in Greek. But now you will be able to, and you will be able to do the verb to be in uh, the imperfect, in the future, and in the subjunctive, the optative, the imperative, infinitive, and participle. As you can see, it looks like a me verb. It's got me at the end of its first principal part. And you can think about it that way. And in fact, knowing those endings of the present indicative active for me verbs, for athematic verbs, is going to be convenient because you already know those things. But when we apply them to the verb to be, we're going to get slightly different ones. And really, you just need to learn these forms as they are for this verb, which is, as one of the most common verbs, also one of the most irregular. So I'll point out the things that are familiar when they are, and you'll just have to learn the variations when you have them. So if we're going to do the present indicative active of the verb a me, the first person singular is going to have the ending you're familiar with, and you can already see that in the principal part. But the second person singular isn't going to use the ending you've already learned, and it's going to look like that, a. Third person singular also will be different, and you'll get sd, estin. But we'll use the men of the first person plural, and we'll use the te of the second person plural. And then we'll get the sigma iota ending with a new movable for the third person plural. Now, accent here is enclitic, mostly. Perhaps you noticed that the first principal part of this verb had an odd-looking accent on the last syllable rather than recessive. That's because in the present indicative, in the two-syllable versions of the word, it is enclitic. Now, that's a concept that we cover in section 114 of Hansen and Quinn, um, for the rules for accent with enclitics, which basically add syllables to the word before and in that way change the rules for accent about what happens in the word before. For right now, for what you're doing with um, the verb me and learning its forms, you need to know that in the paradigm, when it's not in a sentence with other words, um, this is how you will put the accents on. Um, to indicate that they're enclitic, except as you can see there in the second person singular. So we get a me, I am, a, you are, estin, or sd, she is, or he is, or it is, es men, we are, es te, y'all are, and a c, or a sin, they are. One more thing before we go away from the present indicative active. If you see the third person singular with a recessive accent, with an accent on the epsilon, esten, or esti, instead of esti, then it means something a little bit different. It means there is, or it is possible. It has this impersonal idiomatic use. So I'll give you two examples, the ones from Hansen and Quinn. Esti sophostis en te pole. There is some wise man in the city. Or esten apelthain. It is possible to go away. So this is one of those times when all of that work I've been making you do about learning your accents and paying attention to accents on verbs will really pay off because there is an actual difference in meaning here. So again, in the third person singular, normally the verb to be, a me, is enclitic. But if it isn't, if you get recessive accent and the accent is on the epsilon, it can mean there is or it is possible, and you need to remember that distinction. Okay, let's go on to 
the imperfect indicative active. And I'm going to remind you of the athematic of the me verb endings. There they are. And we're going to now look just at the forms for the verb to be for a me. And again, I'll show you which ones are familiar and which ones you'll just have to learn on their own. Here, the stem for this is always going to be an eta. It's imperfect. And the way that this is augmented, you get an eta there. You forget about the iota or anything else. There's not a whole lot of simple logic I can give you for it. You simply need to learn it. And in the first person singular, you do get the ending new, ain, but sometimes you'll also see a for first person singular. We won't use the usual second person singular ending for the second person singular of a me, and we get esta instead. Nor will what you learned for the other me verbs work for the third person singular. You get ain, so there, notice that ain can be either first person or third person singular. In the plural, things get a little more regular again, and we get amen, eta, and asan. The accent here is good old recessive, and so that turns into circumflexes on all of these little bitty forms. And the meaning is, I was, ain or a, esta, you were, ain, she was or he was or it was, amen, we were, eta, y'all were, and asan, they were. So an uh, eta is our stem with a smooth breathing and then endings that are mostly familiar except that second person singular, which is a much earlier dialect form that um, you'll that hung on in the very commonly used Amy. All right, let's go on. We're doing the present system. Um, there's no middle, there's no uh, passive, but we have to do all the moods of the active. So let's think about the present subjunctive active. I want to show you the endings that you already know. Um, o, ace, a, omen, eta, oc. You've used these over and over again in different forms of the subjunctive. To do the verb to be, to do a me in the subjunctive, take off the hyphen to show that these are endings, add smooth breathings, give it recessive accent, and there are the forms of the verb to be in the subjunctive. O, ace, a, omen, eta, oc. What I have just shown you is that the endings you already know with a smooth breathing and an accent are the entire form for the subjunctive active in all the persons and numbers. So you already know them. You simply need to recognize them as words all on their own and as forms, subjunctive forms of the verb to be. If we go on to the optative, oh, we're going to have something nicely similar. Let me remind you of the optative endings of the aorist passive. These are endings you know, you learn them, and these endings and those alternative ones in the plural as the aorist passive optative endings for thematic verbs. Again, if I take off those hyphens to make them look like endings, and I add smooth breathings, and I give them an accent, that won't go back farther than the iota, which is the way it is on those aorist passive optative endings that you already learned, put those in, then I have, again, already the entire form of the verb to be in the optative, in the present optative. Ayain, ayais, aye, ayamen, ayata, ayasan, or the alternative plurals amen, ayta, ayan. That's it. You already know these. You just have to see them as full words and forms of the verb to be in the optative. All right. So let's see. That means that we need to do participles now. And guess what? It's going to be a similar operation. 
if I show you the endings that you first learned for the present participle active, these were the endings that you first learned to put on the first principal part stem to make present active participles, on, usa, on, which then in the genitive became ontos, uses, and ontos. Again, take off those hyphens so that they don't look like endings anymore. Add smooth breathings and persistent accent based on the masculine nominative singular, right? Um, and those are the accents that we get. Then you have the present participle of the verb to be. So they look like endings, but they have accents and smooth breathings, and they are from the verb to be. So that leads to um, all of these forms in the rest of the declension for the present participle active. And I'll put their breathings and accents on. And so in the singular, we get on, usa, on, ontos, uses, ontos, onti, use, onti, onta, usan, on. And then in the vocative, on, usa, on. And of course, the default translation is being because we're doing Amy, the verb to be. Let me show you really quickly the plural, which is going to follow the same um, rules, um, and it's simply the continuation of that declension um, with the strangenesses uh, in the genitive plural feminine and the damnative plural that you're already used to because you already know these words because you already know these endings. Antes, usai, anta, anton, uson, anton, usi or usin, usais, usi or usin. Ontas, usas, onta, and then the vocative, same as the nominative, ontas, usai, onta. So that's the whole participle system. Again, you know it already because those are the endings of the present participle active that you learned back in Unit 8. Now we'll go on to the imperative. These endings are a little bit different. It's just worth learning them exactly um, from the paradigm without learning really rules for it. It's going to be um, is the in the second person singular. You can recognize that the as a passive imperative ending. Esto, you recognize that omega as a third person imperative uh, and the ta as a second person plural imperative. On tone um, looks like one of those that uh, genitive plural participle, same confusion as in imperatives, third person imperative plurals for um, thematic verbs and all the things we've done so far. That will also be there for the verb to be. Estone is the other version uh, for the verb to be. So these have a recessive accent. So we get isti, esta in the second person, and esto in the, second, in the third person singular, ontone or estone in the third person plural imperative, which means be if it's is the or esta, and it means let him be, or let her be, or let it be, or let them be, if it's plural in the third person uh, imperative. That leaves, for the present system, the infinitive. And here again, best just to learn the form, ani. You recognize ni, I hope, as an infinitive ending. You've seen it in other places. It's got fixed accent on the second to last syllable there, and we get ani, and that simply means to be. That's the entire present system, which is almost all the forms of the verb to be, which only has one other principal part, and that is the second principal part, so we're going to do the future indicative. You can see that esomai is deponent, and we're going to conjugate it that way. Esomai, and then the um, regular essay or essay. The irregular moment is here in the third person singular. Instead of esetai, um, we get estai. It's so commonly used that it has been compressed. The epsilon that might be there between the sigma and the tau has disappeared, but it's regular for the rest of the conjugation. The accent is recessive, and so we get esomai. I will be, essay or essay, you will be, estai, she will be, esometha, we will be, esestha, y'all will be, and esontai, they will be. 
And that's it. Those are the forms of Attic Greek's Amy, the verb to be. And now you are ready to use it all the time. Hanson and Quinn will give you lots of practice, and you'll get used to seeing those forms on their own and in compounds.